Good afternoon. I'm Lou Goldberg. I'm an emeritus professor in, uh, from the Department of Psychology here and a senior scientist at Oregon Research Institute. I came to the University of Oregon in 1960 when the department was under 10 people, 10 faculty members, of whom by far the most famous was Leona Tyler. There's an early picture of Leona. Uh, keep that in mind as you see, you will see a later one uh, at the end of my introduction. Leona was born in 1906 in Wisconsin and died in 1993. In 1994, this lecture series was inaugurated. And every year since then, We've invited someone, some distinguished person in one of the many areas in which we want to work uh, to come and talk to us. She was born in Wisconsin. She graduated from high school at an early age. She got her BA in English, English literature at the University of Minnesota, again at an early age. And then she did what women did back then. She took a job as uh, what would today be like a middle school teacher. She taught school uh, for 13 years before taking a course from somebody who encouraged her to go on to graduate school. And she got her PhD from the University of Minnesota in 1940. That same year, she joined the faculty as an instructor here at the University of Oregon. During the course of her life, she became quite famous in psychology as a textbook writer. And here are some of her most famous works. The one for which she is probably most famous is called The Psychology of Human Differences. It went through three or four different editions. But she, were, she also is well known for a book, the work of the, cons, of, the, of the counselor, counseling psychology textbook, which also went through three years. She wrote a book on tests and measurements, and she edited the book on intelligence. And then toward the end of her career, toward the late, latter part of her uh, career, she wrote books about her own specialized interests, including individuality in 1978, and thinking creatively in 1983. She was unique to our department. She was the only president of the American Psychological Association. She was only the fourth woman to be so honored. This was back in an era when being elected president of APA was a huge honor. And nowadays, it's, it's uh, more a political office, but back then it was not. She was dean of the graduate school here at the University of Oregon in 1965 until uh, her retirement in 1971. And that's a much better picture of her. She was an extraordinarily gifted and interesting person, a fine piano player. She had two homes, one of them in Florence and one here in Eugene. And she had grand pianos in both places and played lots and lots of her day. She was never married, but she had many, many friends. And when she passed away, she was very glad, much missed by uh, our family. So today we honor her by a lecture series in her name. Today's speaker will be introduced now. Thank you, Lou, very much. It's always very inspiring to uh, meet, um, you know, colleagues and and our uh, folks who have predecessors who have been here many years before creating great things so that we can do things like we're doing today and inspirational to all of us. 
My name is Benedict McWhorter, and I'm the Department Head of Counseling Psychology and Human Services in the College of Education. Um, and uh, would like to thank all folks involved, of course, with uh, preparing the Leonie Tyler Lecture Series and folks in psychology, especially George, the business organizer, manager, and psychology puts a lot of work together in the details of this. And I'm just here to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Um, Isaac Prilopensky. And I have a great honor, it falls on me, a great honor to do this today. Uh, Leona Tyler's legacy of caring, scholarship, and public service and her profound commitment to fostering human well-being uh, uh, throughout her life are qualities that are well reflected in our Leona Tyler Lecture Series um, speaker this evening uh, and for 2012. And so it's a great privilege to introduce Dr. Isaac Prolotensky. Isaac Prolotensky is a community psychologist, currently serves as Dean of the School of Education at the University of Miami where he is also the inaugural Irwin and Barbara Mautner Chair in a Community Well-Being. Prior to his time at Miami, Dr. Prolotensky served as the director of the PhD program in Community Research and Action at Peabody College, uh, Vanderbilt University. He was born in Argentina. Dr. Prolotensky also lived and has worked in Israel, Canada, and Australia before coming to the United States in 2003. He is fluent in Spanish and English and Hebrew and proficient in Italian and Portuguese. And I hope I didn't leave any other languages off, but you can test him afterward. Um, Dr. Prolotensky is clearly an international scholar and recognized throughout the world. Uh, first time I met him actually was at a psychology conference in Guatemala. So it's one of many, many places in which he has been and visited and spoken over the years. His work is focused on developing community-based approaches to psychological and social health for example, his scholarship has addressed the prevention of child maltreatment and the pro promotion of well-being in families and communities, as well as critiquing the role of applied psychology in society from a critical psychology perspective. His explicit attention to the moral implications of the practice of psychology and commitment to the promotion of social justice are recognized nationally and internationally, and his work in this arena is foundational for many doctoral programs across the country. Certainly his work is required reading in our programs here in Oregon and in the, especially in the Counseling Psychology Doctoral Program. Dr. Prolotensky is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the American Educational Research Association, and the Society for Community Research and Action. He has received significant awards and recognitions internationally and locally for his achievements in the area of psychological research, theory, and practice. For example, in 2010, he received the John Califat Applied Community Psychology Award, as well as the Theory and Research Distinguished Contribution Award from the Community Psychology Division of the APA. Dr. Prilotensky has published seven books and counting, um, as well as, and well more than 100 articles uh, and book chapters with additional significant contributions to the field through his body of edited works invited publications, technical and service reports, and so forth. He has received 25 extramural grants in Canada, Australia, and the United States, and I didn't add them up, but uh, it, it gets up there pretty quickly, pretty high, to conduct some of the interesting community-based work that he's been doing over the years. Um, he's presented keynote addresses in international conferences in 21 countries, but these numbers do not really convey the quality of what Dr. Prolotensky brings to us today. Among his many admirable qualities, Dr. Prolotensky bridges research theory and practice in his writings and in his activities. He advocates for true praxis in the profession of psychology as a whole, and his extensive service to the profession and to his local and broader communities demonstrates that he models this praxis extremely well in his own career. For example, several of his books address the integration of community psychology and critical psychology applied to solving social problems such as child maltreatment, but that's just one of many examples. His work also addresses how to promote organizational change that responds to structural oppression and enhances individual well-being. Much of Dr. Prilotensky's recent scholarship has focused on the construct of well-being and what constitutes wellness, particularly in the context of oppression and marginalization, highlighting really the dimensions of individual community, and relational well-being that he speaks of. Today, Dr. Prolotensky will discuss his conceptualizations of wellness and fairness 
and how they are interdependent constructs. Further, he will demonstrate how these constructs can be applied to the practice at the level of individuals and family, relationally, and at the level of organization. So please help me in warmly welcoming Dr. Isaac Prilotensky. Thank you very much. This is always the best part of my talk. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Um, OK. Great. OK, so I want to make sure that I time myself, because I don't want to run over. Uh, so I'll just make sure. Okay, so there we go. I have all my instruments at hand. I have this, and I have this, and we can get ready. So again, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm very humbled and very honored um, to be here. I know a lot of people work hard to make this happen, so I'm, I'm really honored. And I hope um, that you will learn something from my remarks to make this all worthwhile. So I want to talk about uh, wellness as fairness, and I would like to make a case today for the tight connection between the two concepts of wellness and fairness. So uh, let me start by saying that my case consists of praising five virtues in wellness and fairness. Balance, context, integration, fun, and reflection. Wellness in Your Hands is a multiplayer online game, which I'll be talking about, whereas the SPEC project is an organizational and community intervention based on the principles of strengths, prevention, empowerment, and community change. So first I'll offer some conceptual, theoretical remarks, and then we're going to move into some interventions. Starting with wellness, I would like to make a case for balancing the importance of subjective and objective elements, for balancing across domains of life, for balancing across systems of life, and finally, pathways to wellness. Let's talk about the balance between subjective and objective elements of well-being. In the 90s, Colombians reported the highest level of life satisfaction in the world. This was at the same time that they reported the highest rate of murders, kidnappings, and random violence. Now, what about Mexico? A similar picture emerged there in the first decade of this century. Highest level of life satisfaction, but great violence and instability. How can we explain this happiness paradox? What about Colombians? <laughs> now, what about Mexicans? Um, it turns out that no, it's not tequila or cocaine. Social support, family, and a surge in democracy can compensate for extreme violence and instability. Does that mean that Colombians and Mexicans wouldn't be better off without violence? Of course not. They would love to put a stop to the violence. Does reporting that they are the happiest people on earth paint the whole picture? I don't think so. So to achieve a balanced view of well-being, we have to pay attention to both objective and subjective elements of well-being. And both need to be in balance. Now, incidentally, it's very interesting to note that in the same survey in which Colombians came first, Moldovans came last. You would know this about me, but my family is originally from Moldova, so I think it's quite a miracle that I'm standing in front of you laughing. Moldova is not a very happy country, and this has been done in several studies. Now, uh, the peril of focusing exclusively on subjective well-being is exemplified in this quote from Seligman from his 2002 book, Authentic Happiness, in which he claimed, I quote, 
that as far as happiness and life satisfaction are concerned, you needn't bother to do the following. Make more money, stay healthy, get as much education as possible. No effect. Seligman was not unique in building on the results of surveys, tapping strictly into subjective elements of well-being. And since then, he has changed much of his mind about happiness. But the point remains that many psychologists focused exclusively on the subjective elements of well-being and made some statements that, in my view, can be misleading. If you look at this table, you can see that people who make more money report fewer psychosocial problems, such as depression, isolation, and aggression, contradicting the previous statement by Seligman. Similarly, and contrary to the statement that education does not matter, we can see that people with higher levels of education report fewer psychological problems. Now, a related risk in the scholarship of well-being is talking about the biopsycho without the social, uh, thus undermining the impact of social conditions in favor of biological and psychological causes. Psychologists like Sonia Lubomirsky, whose work I otherwise highly respect, claim that well-being is largely determined by genetics, which, in their view, accounts for 50% of well-being, motivation accounts for 40%, and social circumstances only 10%. Is this really true? It seems to me that this is greatly undermining the role of the social environment on health and well-being, so let's have a look. Compare the percentage of people very satisfied with life in Denmark and Belgium between 1973 and 1998. So let's start with Denmark. As you can see, between that period of time, the percentage of people reporting higher levels of satisfaction went up from 50% to 67%. In the same period of time, satisfaction with life in Belgium went down from about 44% to 19%. Now, do you think that the gene pool changed in 25 years? It's very unlikely, right? The gene, the gene pool changes over generations and generations. So the changes are due to favorable social circumstances in Denmark and unfavorable social conditions in Belgium. Russia offers another interesting example of decline in life satisfaction. In a period of 15 years, the percentage of people who reported satisfaction with life went down from 70% to 38%. Do you think that vodka got into the gene pool? I don't think so. What we're seeing is the remarkable impact of social circumstances uh, on life satisfaction. Now, when you compare community well-being across nations, it turns out that countries with low levels of inequality, such as Japan, Sweden, and Finland, experience far fewer social problems than rich countries with more inequality. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see an index of all these uh, social problems. In the last 11 years, I have moved from Canada to Australia, and from Australia to the USA. As you can tell from these arrows, I'm going definitely in the wrong direction. Uh, now, I also want to talk about another type of balance. In addition to balancing objective and subjective elements of well-being, we need to consider various domains of life as key elements of well-being. These six domains represent the majority of sources of happiness and challenges in life. We call them ICOPE. It's an acronym for interpersonal, community, organizational, physical, psychological, and economic well-being. And I will share in a few moments how we build those building blocks into the games that we are building to promote health and wellness. Now, similarly, we need to pay attention to various systems of life. And just as the personal, I, sorry, not just at the personal level, but also at the relational, organizational, and communal levels. Even if only because extra personal systems influence the personal system itself. All the systems are interrelated, and we need 
to escape the temptation to focus only on one, usually the personal system. Now, finally, we need to embrace multiple avenues to wellness, and this is a synthesis of seven principles of wellness, wellness promotion that reinforce each other. We have integrated these seven principles into the online intervention that I will share with you in a few minutes. So we're now in a position to define wellness. Wellness is a positive state of affairs in individuals, relationships, organizations, communities, and the natural environment brought about by the satisfaction of objective and subjective needs across domains of life. And pathways to wellness include behavioral, emotional, cognitive, interactional, contextual, informational, and sequential approaches. I mean, it's a bit of a mouthful. It, but it's really consisting of different domains of life and different strategies. In addition, wellness is determined by prevailing conditions of justice across life systems. So now we're going to explore the second concept that I wanted to discuss with you today, which is justice or fairness. Having defined wellness, let's turn our attention to fairness. In a few moments, we will see how fairness relates to wellness. But first, let me examine distributive and other types of justice. As noted by Miller and Sandel, distributive justice pertains to fairness in allocations of gains and pains, burdens and privileges. Now, the question is, how do we ascertain what is fair and what is due a person? We can consider merit, need, or equality. Now, these criteria are not mutually exclusive. Context should determine what criterion must be preferred in each case. In social conditions of inequality, we must accord preference to needs over merit and ability. Under conditions of relative equality, where the gap between classes or the various groups is not very pronounced, it is possible indeed to favor merit and effort over needs. In a context of plenty of opportunities for everyone, it is possible that ability and effort will be the preferred choice. Now, Taking context into account, we see that societies aspiring to justice must seek an equilibrium among all criteria. In context of inequality, we should favor need because it's not fair to reward people on the basis of effort if they don't all start life from the same place. We must pay attention to where everybody starts life. When context of inequality call for need and equality, but the culture favors effort, it's simply because privileged groups benefit from this reasoning. In short, ignoring context results in lack of fairness. Now, although when people talk about social justice, they talk primarily about distributive justice, there are other important types we should keep in mind. Distributive, procedural, relational, retributive, and informational justice are all recognized in the justice scholarship. Today I want to propose that intrapersonal, developmental, and cultural are just as important. Intrapersonal pertains to lack of fairness towards oneself. Developmental injustice pertains to cases in which people are subjected to unfair treatment due to their developmental stages. Child abuse, elder abuse, and parentification of children are cases of developmental injustice. Now, cultural injustice takes place when minority groups are discriminated on the basis of their identity. I will claim in a few minutes that all these types of justice affect well-being seriously, leading me to think of wellness as fairness. So we're now in a position to integrate what we know about fairness with wellness. If we concentrate for a minute on the top, the top five systems of wellness across the top row, 
we can see that the wellness of each system is manifested in objective and subjective signs. That's, these are the second and third row, objective and subjective elements uh, of well-being, which are in turn influenced by certain values and by social justice. So the way this works is that the bottom rows are influencing the top rows. So if we take a relationship, for example, we want to balance what is due each party in the relationship. If we look at this column for a moment, we want to balance what, it sh what is due each one of the individuals involved. Failures of fairness ultimately result in failures of wellness. The less fairness, the less wellness. So now we are in a position to see how different types of justice influence different types of well-being. So what you see at the top of this sphere are the six dom domains of wellness, which I call I cope, interpersonal, community, occupational, etc. So based on extensive research, we can see that there are six domains of wellness at the top. And here I argue that people can be unfair to themselves. We can see this in cases of self-injurious behavior or self-deprecating talk, and in which case intrapersonal injustice may be causing physical and psychological damage. At the interpersonal level, I would like to submit that in addition to distributive and procedural justice, there are two other important types, as I said before, developmental and relational justice. So, once again, developmental justice concerns the distribution of roles and responsibilities that are adequate or inadequate to the developmental stage of a person. And as I mentioned, parentification of children is just an example. Now, relational justice, in turn, concerns the fair and equitable distribution of relational goods, such as respect, caring, and support. Now, um, the research on organizational justice supports four types of justice, distributive, procedural, relational, and informational. Distributive justice is, infor sorry, informational justice is the new type which we have not covered yet, closely related to procedural justice, which is about the fairness in the very process of allocating justice, Informational is about the transparency of decisions and access to information about the organization. These four types of justice impact the top level of uh, well-being, which is, again, reflected in these uh, slices. So all these are extensions of interpersonal, community, occupational. So we see that there are all interpersonal relationships characterized by interpersonal support and the different domains of well-being. And I maintain that the same applies to organizations. These are just extensions of interpersonal, community, occupational, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the higher the level of justice we achieve at the bottom of the sphere, the higher the level of well-being we can achieve at the top of the sphere. Uh, and finally, at the societal level, the outermost ring, we add two new types of justice, retributive and cultural. And retributive justice is about following the law and being accountable. Corruption is rampant in many countries. I come from one of those. Corruption diminish, diminishes trust and erodes community. Cultural justice, in turn, is about the fair and equitable distribution of resources among members of all cultural groups. At the top level of the sphere, we see again how the extension of interpersonal well-being is reflected in the community, participation, inclusion, dignity, and you can see the various other domains. Right? So in psychological well-being, I claim that communities can either foster freedom and self-determination or they can try to thwart it. OK, so now how do they all come together? What is the conceptual integration between wellness as fairness? So here I would like to talk about 
the integration of the two concepts. And if we look at the two continua for a moment, we see that there are certain psychosocial processes that mediate uh, between them. Uh, in my view, optimal conditions of justice lead to thriving through a series of four mechanisms. Promotion of responsive conditions to the human being, prevention of risks, individual pursuit of wellness, and the avoidance of comparison with other people. As the social psychologist Susan Fisk has amply demonstrated, envy and scorn are harmful to the envied, the envious, the scorned, and the scornful. People living under optimal conditions of justice have fewer reasons to envy and score others. All these mechanisms help in the pursuit of thriving. Now, suboptimal conditions of justice lead to coping, not to thriving, because by definition, suboptimal conditions impose certain hardships. Under suboptimal conditions of justice, people cope with through resilience, adaptation, and compensation, which are known psychological principles. In addition, it has been found that people often cope by comparing themselves to people who are lower in social status than they are. This is not the healthiest of mechanisms, but it is what people often do. Now, under vulnerable conditions of injustice, I want to repeat, vulnerable conditions of injustice, when the system is about to crumble, as we saw in the Arab Spring, where dictatorships were basically giving in to democracy, people confront and challenge systems of injustice. They do so through four related mechanisms, critical experiences, critical consciousness, critical action, and what I call righteous comparisons. People look at other communities and societies and decide that they deserve as much freedom and prosperity as others. People are entitled to the same rights and liberties as other people. Now, this leads them indeed to confront injustice. Finally, there are people who live, unfortunately, in persisting conditions of injustice that lead people just to suffering. Under conditions of injustice, people experience oppression, helplessness, and engage in upward comparisons. This is not helpful, but it is the reality that many people live with. Our job as psychologists is to help communities move from the right to the left of this graph. So I've said a few words about wellness and fairness and how, in my view, the two of them come together. So I would like to say a few words now about two interventions that I've been working on to try to promote both wellness and fairness. Over the years, I've been concerned with the promotion of these two uh, values, and today I will discuss a, a couple of them. The first one is called Wellness in Your Hands, and is what it's called an MMOG, or a Massively Multiplayer Online Game, that engages users in wellness and fairness, and is based on psychological principles of behavior change. So we already reviewed before the I-COPE building blocks of well-being, and the goal of our game is to help people in the six domains of life, you can see within each building block of wellness the specific tasks we seek to help with. For example, how to cope with stress, how to improve nutrition, how to build a better community, etc. So our intervention leverages four play techniques, avatars, videos, challenging games, and social media. Each mini-game, as we call them, we have 60 of those, uh, are, each game is built on the bare I can principles of health promotion. And you can see here the various principles we use to build games. For example, uh, goal setting, self-regulation, 
problem solving. These fall under the behavior category, mindset and self-efficacy, cognitive errors, self-talk and rumination. So these are the different uh, constructs that go into building each game, which is pretty challenging because you have to do this in few words and you have to do this in an animated and engaging way. So we created some cartoon characters that help the user with the different domains of health and wellness. So we have berry behavior and Emma emotions and Innocentia interactions. So we have different characters that are going to help you with your, um, with your challenge. So the idea is that people have an interest in watching movies and learning from vignettes and how other people deal with issues. And if during the game, you see people struggling, like we saw now. You see people also resolving the conflict. So we demonstrate how they can come to terms with different uh, opinions. And then we see people, how they maintain their games. Because as we all know, it's not so easy once you have improved the behavior reduce stress, improve nutrition, it's very difficult to keep it up. So the game aims to both show conflict, show a challenge, how you cope with this successfully, and then eventually, what do you need to do to sustain that behavior, which is such a challenge in the field of health promotion. Okay, so moving right along, uh, I want to be able now to review what is the theory of change behind all of this. Um, and the Wellness in Your Hands game aims to promote wellness directly. We believe that by learning certain uh, principles of behavior change, you can improve your wellness. But also, the game indirectly, through awareness of fairness and unfairness in our lives, is going to promote uh, wellness. So there, is, there are a lot of conflicts. There are many interpersonal conflicts. There are community conflicts. I haven't shown you all of it. But we're trying to demonstrate how issues of justice impact well-being. So the way we do this, uh, we see here at the top row the six I cope domains of life, interpersonal, community, psychological, etc. And you can see here different aspects of justice. And you can see different shots. I haven't shown them all to you. But each one of the vignettes that I've shown you demonstrates the intersection between one aspect of justice in one domain uh, of wellness. So this is in the pilot stages. I cannot show you results. Unfortunately, it's taking a while to build this, uh, but we are planning a pilot study in May. Now, in the next figure, what you see is that our games, which accompany the vignettes, your avatar, goes to the movies and they watch the vignette and then there are games that accompany each one of those uh, to study, promote, integrate wellness and fairness. So let me summarize. Uh, and so what is wellness in uh, your hands? Uh, this is a game, an online game that aims to improve wellness directly and indirectly, directly through educational videos, games and social media and indirectly through awareness of fairness and, and unfairness in our lives. So now I'm moving to the final portion of my presentation. I want to talk about a second intervention that I've been working on. This, this has been much longer, and we have some data for it. The second intervention, which I have worked on for about nine, 10 years, is called SPEC, which stands for Strengths, Prevention, Empowerment, and Community Change. And this is an organizational intervention to promote community well-being. So let me share uh, with you what this is all about. Uh, so SPEC really aims to combat four fundamental problems in many helping professions. We call these problems the DRAIN approach, uh, which stands for professionals focusing on deficits of individuals and communities, for being reactive, arrogant, and blaming individuals for their misfortune. Now, SPEC aims to offer an alternative to these practices, which I think are very negative. 
Now, spec is built on contextual and affirmation fields. Here we see the contextual field in which interventions are classified according to temporal or ecological dimensions. Temporal refers to proactive or reactive. So we can see this is the temporal dimension, whereas ecological refers to the system the intervention addresses, collective or individual. Now, we can see that most of our societal efforts go towards this quadrant, which is the reactive individual quadrant. This is where most helping professions put most of their efforts. And I claim that instead of working here, we should do more of this because it is much more effective and saves uh, money. Now, uh, next, I want to talk about what I call the affirmation field, which refers to the participation and capabilities dimensions of interventions. Uh, so the more participation of clients, the more empowering the intervention is, the more voice and choice. Now, this, similarly, the more we concentrate on people's strengths as opposed to their deficits, the more helpful uh, it is. Once again, we see a disconnect between where we are today in society. We are forever creating more patients and more clients and more DSM categories, uh, whereas we should be working more on this quadrant. So that was pretty much the impetus for developing an action research project uh, with 10 community-based organizations to promote these four principles, strength, prevention, empowerment, and community change. This was a six-year study in two cities consisting of the following training for um, mental health and social service workers, teamwork, consultation, professional development, and action research. So we trained individuals um, in SPEC principles, and we asked them to create teams within their organizations to foster these practices within each setting. In addition, we consulted with them. This was a very labor-intensive project. And this is our theory of change. Uh, this also addresses wellness and fairness. Our interventions seek to promote organizational fairness, which leads to organizational wellness and community fairness at the same time. A healthier and fairer organization pushes for a fair and well community. So this is the theory that has been guiding our efforts. Now, based on our studies, we see that for interventions at the, on the top bar, these type of interventions to achieve these types of outcomes, each organization needs to have a series of conditions. So these are the necessary conditions to achieve positive change in these organizations. So let me say a few words about each one of them. And I'm just quickly going to check the time. So I'm, I'm about right. I'll finish in about two minutes. So in our team, we think of climate and resources as generic conditions of wellness that apply to all organizations, regardless of what type of organizations there is. This could be a business, or it could be industry, or it could be a healthcare organization. Now, in contrast to these generic conditions, we think that for organizations to pursue social justice, they also require specific conditions about issues of justice, power, and ecology, and they need a particular type of support from their board, leadership, and funders. Now, these are organizations that challenge the status quo. So it's not just enough to be an efficient organization. You have to have certain levels of consciousness about these domains. So what we see here uh, is that, again, at the top, we see the six domains of well-being. And you see here four different types of justice, and our intervention, the action research that we have conducted, as well as the training and the consultation and team development, they address either 
external activities of the organizations, for example, to promote voice and choice of community members, we call this an external outcome, a advocacy for policy changes for gay rights and education, that's an external outcome that promotes community wellness and distributive justice. So this is a classification of the outcomes of our intervention depending on the type of justice and the type of wellness that they address. And we also achieved some internal changes within organizations, such as enhanced sense of control by employees and discussions about workload. So these were some of, this is just a brief summary of our uh, work. So where are some of the selected outcomes? After working for six years with 10 organizations, we can see that some of the results include staff empowerment, better communication within organizations, new programs, and the blending of therapy with social change. So in sum, a SPEC interventions aim to improve community wellness through enhanced organizational awareness, fairness, wellness, and effectiveness, which in turn increase community wellness and fairness. So now, to review, we covered three key concepts, wellness, fairness, wellness as fairness, and two interventions, wellness in your hands, and we also covered the SPEC project. Let me conclude with some reflections. In his recent book, The Idea of Justice, Sen asks the following question. How adequate is the perspective of happiness in judging a person's well-being? He claims that we could err through not being fair to the importance of happiness or subjective well-being, or through overestimating its importance in judging the well-being of people, or being blind to the limitations of making happiness the main or only basic of assessment of social justice and social welfare. So these are important questions that Amartya Sen raises. What are the implications of Sen's critique for psychology? Given its track record, psychology is likely to err by, one, overestimating the importance of happiness for well-being, and two, underestimating the importance of justice in well-being. So to remedy that, let's pursue one, wellness in balance, two, fairness in context, three, wellness and fairness through fun and questioning of organizational and community norms that decouple justice from well-being, and finally, Let's pursue wellness as, and fairness, wellness as fairness through integration of justice and well-being in a comprehensive philosophy of the good life and good society. Thank you very much. So I guess we can open it up for questions, comments. Happy to try to address any questions or comments you may have, critiques, challenges. We don't have to. We can all just go straight to the reception and have wine. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. The wellness in your hands, what age group is it targeted for? Um, our first group is 18 and above. Uh, these are the videos that we developed it for. However, it'll, we are not sure yet that the graphs that we have will appeal to that uh, population. So this is all under construction. But initially, we targeted this for the adult population. We think this can lend itself very easily to, to younger populations as well. younger than 18, they involve lots of, well, especially for males, lots of murder and mayhem and ideally finding sex. 
So I'm just wondering how realistic it is that this is going to be actually something that they're going to consider fun. Right, right. I mean, it's definitely a challenge, and I, I don't have the, the definitive answer for that. Who are struggling with their kids being addicted to video games that they really love, but they don't really have many of these characters in the game. Right, right. So I, I agree with you. Um, there is a new platform. It's called the Leapfrog. Uh, some of you may know it if you have young children in your family. It's like an iPad for children, and they're trying to develop educational games that are more along our lines as opposed to the point and shoot and kill and blood uh, type of games. And from what we understand, it's very successful. Um, so this is a new company, uh, and they have only like 20, 30 games. There are probably thousands of violent games, but there are very few of these types of educational games. So we're hoping to learn from what's working and, and, and try to make a difference uh, in how kids learn about health and wellness. Yes, please. When you uh, evaluate these games or the, this intervention, what will some of your measures of effectiveness be? Right. Uh, so I didn't show this because of lack of time, but we're developing an expansion of a life satisfaction scale. Some of you may be familiar with the Contril self-anchoring scale, which is um, like a ladder of satisfaction in life, it's being used many times, we're expanding this to the six domains of life that we are exploring, interpersonal, community, occupational, physical, psychological, economic. Now, this will be our first attempt. In other words, a self-report, which some people might say it's a weak, really, measure of effectiveness, but we are building this into the game we have a ladder where you choose where you are, past, present, and future, and the computer computes an average, and it gives you a nice profile of where you are. So we're trying to do this in an educational way so that you can do it as part of the game. You do your self-assessment. You can do it before, after. You can do, do it a few times. So initially, this is how we're going uh, to measure um, effectiveness. Now, Ideally, we would like to obtain in the future harder measures, uh, like a body mass index, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we're also going to have a formative evaluation, because right now uh, we are not sure that all the games will work. So during the pilot, we're going to build a lot of questions and focus groups about what you like, what you don't like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're really at the at the first floor of this enterprise. Yes. Um, I, I really like the iCOPE um, building blocks of wellness framework and thinking about wellness. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about how well that fits into the ecological model, mm -hmm. that's in all levels and all systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the chrono system, so across time, can you talk a little bit more about um, wellness across time and across generations, mm -hmm. and also how we can create interventions that address things like historical trauma. Mm -hmm. So wellness that's not just like the here and now in the future, but how do we address <laughs> wellness in the past? Well, uh, that's a big issue that um, really, what I can say about the conceptualization of I cope and also the bet I can principles is that we have tried to concentrate ecologically um, on one of our aspects is the C4 context in Bet I Can and the C4 community. Um, so I believe that this has an opportunity to educate people to pay more attention to the context of their lives, right? Um, we have not gone, nor do I think that perhaps this intervention would be appropriate to deal with the type of trauma that you are considering. But I think the concept could work. 
because context is not just about ecological levels, but also about the chronological lifespan of people. But I would love to hear from you or others how this may be applied. Uh, I think it has promised, but I have not thought about that a lot. Thank you for the question. I saw another hand somewhere. Right. So as I said, we have 36 of these vignettes. And we have some in which uh, uh, stigma and stereotype and discrimination are featured more prominently than the ones I showed uh, because lack of time. Uh, so this is how we uh, tried to address some of those issues. Now, we have to keep in mind the limitations of this. Right? So my, it, this is just an online game, basically, to raise awareness about some of these concepts. My hope is that just like there are many social interventions, like Weight Watchers, or Alcoholics Anonymous, or self-help groups for people with schizophrenia or depression, I would love one day, just like there are book clubs where people read a book, and then they get together to discuss it, it would be wonderful for people to play games and learn about certain concepts and then get together in community wellness groups uh, to advance their health and wellness. Because I believe many of the games that are, many of the self-help groups that exist today are very reactive, right? If you have a weight problem, you go to Weight Watchers. If you have a, an addiction problem, you go to AA. And I do not believe that we have maximized the possibilities for health and wellness promotion groups, self-help groups. So this could be an impetus. This, this is my, my hope and my aspiration. It ties in with the SPEC approach, to build on people's strengths in a community, to be prevented, to empower people to take charge of their health and wellness and their relationships, and to work together to incite community change. Um, so I'm very aware of the limitations of this game, but there are also possibilities for getting people together to talk about how can we build a better community. Um, because think about it, it, it does not happen often. Uh, the level of community civic social capital that exists, which is diminishing in many communities, in this country, as, as Robert Putnam demonstrated in bowling alone, right? Social capital is declining. Uh, you will be hard pressed to find a lot of groups getting together with the charge of building community. Some churches do it, but it's not as prevalent as I think we could make it, or, or as appealing as a game could inside. These are some of my thoughts. Yes. Just a comment on Jenny's um, question or comment about historical trauma and, and the connection between the past and the present. It just sparked a thought um, for me around um, healing and reconciliation being a bridge between the past and the present and into the future. And part of what is, in, what is intriguing about the idea of wellness is having a, the capacity to heal. Um, and that oftentimes what prevents communities from coming together or even two people coming together to look forward to the future at promoting wellness is the idea that the reconciliation and the healing hasn't occurred. There hasn't been an acknowledgement of past, whether it's interpersonal or a larger systemic um, oppression mm -hmm. that has occurred. So mm -hmm. the word healing just kind of popped up for me and I just throw it out mm -hmm. there for it's not a question, but um, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting question. Yes, at the back. I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about in, in your spec interventions, uh, particularly the, the empowerment piece. Yeah. I love the new dimensions of, of justice. Um, 
because and and I think it would be nice to add historical um, in there because I, I think that it's very often that a client comes in internally oppressed or self oppressed um, and um, I w sometimes the, the conceptual the general concept of empowerment can go in in the wrong direction particularly when looking at the relationship between the counselor and the client um, could that then become a hierarchical relationship where I am empowering someone because I have the ability to, to give power or to uh, promote power because of the differential? H how do your empowerment interventions look like and how do you then work with someone who might need to go through um, the understanding and development for interpersonal justice? How do you work that, those two um, constructs together? So let me address the first part that you ask about the potential conflict between being in a hierarchical relationship uh, and, and empowering somebody else. I really do not see a contradiction. Um, the, some people have more power than others. And some people are in a position to help other people. So I think it's better to acknowledge that than to start the conversation imagining that we both have the same degree of power. Uh, and yes, some people have skills that other people don't have. And the whole therapeutic enterprise is built on that assumption, that I have certain skills and knowledge and techniques that might help other people. Um, so I do not interpret this as a condescending approach or a perpetuation of injustice. I think power is there to be used for wellness and fairness. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to amplify somebody's voice, I think we should use it. Uh, and I, I don't see this as a perpetuating a hierarchy. Of course, it's a problem if you use your power to put down other people and to be condescending, right? So that, that will be an abuse of your power and a perpetuation of hierarchy, so on and so forth. Um, now, how does it work in our project? Um, the, the SPEC project is built on the, I think, well-documented assumption, and I, don't, I didn't have time to show you the data, about how prevalent the reactive and individualistic mode of helping really are in the medical, psychological, social work, counseling, nursing, all the helping professions. There is lots of data to document that a minuscule amount of resources go to prevention and community approaches. Similarly, many organizations and, and helping professions they believe they are empowering people, but they are not. So there are a series of operating myths, right? If you go to a, um, an average uh, human service organization or mental health clinic, and if you ask the, the, the staff, do you, um, do you empower your, your clients or your own employees? Of course, the answer will be uniformly, yes, we do it. When you dig deeper and we develop some techniques to dig deeper, then you find out that mostly they don't. It's mostly what I call the drain approach as opposed to the spec approach. So this is a psychoeducational intervention to work with people who deliver the services to go deeper into what does it mean to build on people's strengths? What does it mean to be really preventive, empowering, so on and so forth? So there was a lot of education involved in this process. Uh, we worked with these organizations for many years. There was a lot of training, a lot of peer mentoring, team building, organizational consultations. So there were a, a variety of techniques to try to, to be really reflective about whether you are really being proactive or reactive, et cetera, et cetera. Does that begin to answer the question? Thank you. Okay, I think we're, uh, we're ready. So thank you very much uh, for the attention and your comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm.